Thank you very much for the presentations. My name is Kirsten Ockfeldt. I work with MSF, Doctors Without Borders. Um, I, in view of the, of the, of the discussion around uh, sustainable development financing and especially the role of ODA, ODA um, there is also currently ongoing discussions in some of the global health initiatives around um, income classification, using in income classification to determine funding allocation, but also our eligibility and graduation schemes. Um, and, and we in MSF, we, we're very worried about um, the way that we see as an overemphasis <coughs> of G, G and I per capita, for example, as, as the, the determining indicator. Um, and uh, as opposed to, for example, health needs. And so uh, we recognize, of course, there's a huge need for financial resources and the need to look at a variety of sources of funding. Uh, but what we see is uh, there's a conflict in the way the goalposts are being moved while we're not yet uh, reaching the MDGs. Uh, one example is the Eastern Europe, Central Asian region with increasing levels of HIV and MDR-TB, for example. Um, so while there are some initiatives that are trying to look at um, different ways to, um, to mitigate the, the limitations of income classification, such as the Equitable Access Initiative of the Global Fund with others, uh, they, we see that we still come back to the income classifications of countries as, as the determining indicator. So my question to either to Greenhill and or um, Sachs is, um, how do you see and if ODA would be um, very much focused on low-income countries or least developed countries, um, would it be uh, would it be possible to come come up with a complex framework for with taking into consideration the middle-income countries and actually capture the health needs uh, appropriately to, to reach uh, those that are most in need? Thank, Thank you. you. So that's one for Rom Romney and Jeff to come back to. Can we go right over here now? No, Could I re remind people to say who they are before they ask the question? Sure. I'm Nuria Molina from ActionAid. Um, as we were going into detail into this very interesting conversation, I was thinking actually here for this year and for the SDGs, we have two quite different, although complementary, goals or agendas. One is the one that we've just been reflecting on, which is the need to roughly finish the job we started, focused on fragile states, extreme poverty, etc., which requires a set of financing which is more limited in ways, and mobilizing this financing and mobilizing social movements in ways that we know we've done <coughs> in the past. At the same time, we have an agenda which we were discussing earlier, or that uh, Jeff was prompting us to discuss earlier, which is totally different, which is the more the longer term, how we shift the way we structure our economy and our very differently. And I see two key um, bottlenecks there. That the way of doing this, well, it requires more money to start with. And the way of doing this, including the social mobilization side of things, it's very different. It's not so much the more make poverty history type of mobilization we mobilize to help some people down there to solve extreme poverty and extreme problems. It's about how do we rethink to key obsessions, which are GDP growth obsession, and also, the free market capitalism obsession. I do agree that global capitalism can give the answers, but global capitalism, it can take many forms and shapes. So how do we do this uh, successfully? OK, uh, two, two rows back. Um, Anna Thomas, also from ActionAid, giving you a double. Mine's very quick. <laughs> um, absolutely, I think we pretty much all agree on the need for more and better international public finance, but shouldn't developing countries decide for themselves what the main priorities for spending it is? Okay, thank you. And then one right, right at the back here. Good morning, uh, Jane Backhurst from British Red Cross. Um, I really welcome, and we really welcome, the, the attention as well to the issues around fragile states, given that none of the fragile states have actually met any of the MDGs, uh, and also the attention to the least developed countries. One of the points I think is still lacking um, as a mainstream uh, concept within all of these conversations in the financing for is the link between financing for development, the Zendai work, the SDG process, etc. But also across all of that, as Romani was saying earlier, the attention to resilience, what this really means, and, and how to support communities that are facing 
long-term stresses as well as shocks uh, and the whole linking relief rehabilitation and development so there's a lot of there that still needs to be translated across the piece i think and need brought out especially community resilience which is within some of the targets but unless we're actually wrapping into this these discussions we stand to lose some of those okay thank you. gains thanks thank you and um, Ambassador, do you, do you want to? I, I, we'll have another round of questions for all those of you who've been waving at me. Um, Ambassador, do you, do you want to maybe just take that question? Because I, I, I guess at the heart of it is this issue of how the international summits are linked up in a way that you know, because Sendai is clearly an important part of the agenda, the humanitarian summit. Are, are you, to some degree, framing your discussions in the light of those uh, at those later meetings? <coughs> Um, the answer is yes, to some degree we are. The, the, the challenge, of course, is that um, we need all of these processes to be linked. Hmm? Uh, basically because what we need is uh, decisions by governments. And if governments do not take decisions that understand that all of these issues are interlinked, <coughs> they will really, we will not really be able to reach our goals. Uh, that goes, you know, but the, the problem, of course, is that uh, the climate uh, summit is then coming at the very end of this, in, 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 in December. And uh, frankly speaking, I do not believe that we have sort of a, uh, good ideas on how we are going to, to link that both to the uh, summit in September on the post-2015 and to the Addis meeting. We all know that these issues uh, have to be seen together. But how we are going to do it is still work in progress. Okay, thank you. Mr. Smith, there was specifically a question on fragile states. And <coughs> I think relating to the point that you raised about, you know, often aid is given on terms or in forms that don't necessarily correspond to the most immediate priorities of government. Make, could you maybe respond to that? Yeah, yeah, I think it's quite a pertinent uh, observation or question. But actually, the communities in, this, in these countries, they know where the thorn is actually breaking. They know what their priorities are. Problem lies in terms of the capacity to state and articulate and put it in a shape, in a form, that would be able to, 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 to correlate with the overall developmental or intervention agenda. But otherwise, take the case of South Sudan. The, the issues of uh, uh, infrastructure, the communities do not interact. They do not know themselves. Again, this stands in the way of state building and peace building. If they, you, you, you were to connect the, the, to connect the country to itself, to the communities, by way of infrastructure and so on, you, you, you have a way out. If you are to provide minimum amounts of uh, energy for macro uh, financing activities to flourish, you, you have a, a solution. And then, of course, issues to do with health, education, and, and clean drinking water. This always come up uh, on top in any community kind of uh, discussions relating to these matters. Yeah. The, Communities must decide really what they want, and then somebody comes in to help them put it in a better shape. Thank you. Thank you very much. R uh, Rami, maybe you, if you could respond to Jeff's concerns as well, and as well as those other issues you might want to take up. Um, sure, yes. Uh, uh, we don't want to have an intro panel uh, uh, scrap. But um, no, I just wanted to say on social protection, yes, it's been very powerfully utilised in middle-income countries, but there's also quite a lot of evidence from low-income countries, particularly African countries, uh, Kenya, Malawi. Um, we've increased investment in agricultural assets as a result of transfers in Ethiopia, uh, Zimbabwe, um, in a range of fragile states. There are actually a good range of examples of... Um, where cash transfers have actually really helped to, to reduce poverty and promote growth. And I think that's really the, the, the really critical point um, in African countries as well as the, the stable middle-income countries. It's very patchy at small scale, and that's partly why we think it's a funding mechanism that will enable countries to scale it up if they want to, related to Anna's point. I mean, nobody's saying to countries they've got to do this. They're not <coughs> successful generally when they're imposed outside from donors, but to have a long-term good quality financing mechanism so the countries who want to do it, a little bit like with, with the Global Fund and other mechanisms, actually have the su support uh, to, to do it. 
Can I just make one point on the in income classifications uh, point? I just want to be clear on the income classifications point. I also agree that income isn't necessarily a good um, uh, classification, middle income, low income, what does that really mean? We had a debate at the Cape Conference in 2012 about whether South Sudan was now a, a MIC, and you know, it, 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 that debate seems a little bit unreal. However, when you look at when we've actually done the costing, this is just for the social sectors, bear in mind, it doesn't cover infrastructure. Interestingly enough, the boundary of whether countries could potentially fund it domestically or the extent to which they need IPF happens to come at around the lick mick threshold. So that's interesting, but I'm not saying that we need, necessarily need those categorizations. Thanks. Jeff, I know the temptation is going to be to endeavor <laughs> on the social protection thing, and I don't want to preclude you responding on that. But I did want to ask you one other thing that, you know, I was very struck by reading the report that you and Guido did yeah. with the, the treatment of education. And for me, you know, we've spoken about this before, but it's an area of perennial frustration because, you know, everyone around the world essentially buys into the argument that, you know, if you haven't got the infrastructure in place, that's one constraint if you haven't got education in place, that the human capital constraints are, are such that all bets are off, actually, on progress in many of the areas. And, and you mentioned that, you know, if you can't keep girls in, in secondary education, it has that implications yep. for fertility, demography, for growth, for everything else. And yet, despite <coughs> that, all of the evidence on education is pointing in the wrong direction. They, we have a pitiful amount that goes into primary education, and it's coming down, especially in the poorest countries, especially in fragile states. An even more pitiful amount goes into secondary education, which is a condition for making progress in primary as well. Um, and the response has been, I mean, there's just not an effective, you know, there's nothing comparable to what we've seen in the global funds in health that, you know, you, that you've been so involved in. And I am really interested in understanding you, what, what do you see as the blockage to the ambition <coughs> that, that we need? And what should the framing look like for, for a sort of initiative that could make a difference in Addis? Great. Th thanks a lot. Yeah, I, it has been a big mystery for me over the 14 years that I've been advisor on the MDGs to the UN why education never got the foothold. Uh, I can tell you at the beginning of the process there was no global fund for health, there was no global fund for education. I helped to lead the fight for more donor resources for health. That was my focus in 2000, 2001. And uh, Bill Gates came in with billions of dollars personally uh, and made a transformation as a result of that. Uh, Kofi called for the Global Fund. I helped work with him on the design of that. Uh, Norway was critical at every step. I consider myself a uh, you know, as uh, I, I hope someday, even even to, if I can have some honorary little bit of Norwegian uh, in me, because it was Gro Brundtland, it was uh, Tori Gadal, it was uh, Jonas Garstore, uh, and uh, this was transformative. Education never found that championship. I don't know why. Uh, and then uh, Gordon, who's great and is a great champion of this, uh, was brought in too late in the day on the MDGs, but I want him to be the champion for the SDGs uh, on this. We can make the same breakthrough. There's nothing intrinsically different. But in general, other than Norway, Sweden, Denmark, now the UK, other donors don't want to hear about money. They don't want to hear about new things. So the normal rule is you got to push hard to create something. The Global Fund was not a piece of cake, I can tell you, to just walk in and get this. The fight over getting AIDS treatment was a real fight. The fight to scale up malaria was a real fight for years and years and years. Academia always, by the way, is never on the leading edge. The role of academia is to say, prove it, prove it, prove it, prove it, prove it. Uh, and then once it's proven, they say, ah, it was obvious and it's not even important. That, that's, that, that's the role of academia. Okay, there's a useful role, prove it is a good thing, but it's not advocacy uh, and it's not where the breakthroughs come from. So we need to advocate for a global fund for education and a basic message that says get serious with the money. Look at the gap. The money is 
20 billion dollar gap. Why is the GPE collecting 500 million a year? What's the target? What's the point? And I, you know, I was full force out for the GPE replenishment. But there was, but even as the reality said we need 20 some billion, we had this tiny replenishment. The Poor countries committed their own resources, which are wonderful. The headline was 28 billion collected, 27 billion of which came from the developing countries themselves, and everybody patted themselves on the back. That is not advocacy. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Advocacy is to say we got a 20 billion dollar gap. Now let's go out and close that gap. Now uh, there are some differences in the dynamics. The health was sold for proper reasons, life and death, it's immediate. On the other hand, education, everybody understands education. So we, it is sellable, but it wasn't sold the same way. And the second thing is, with the health, there were two things that there haven't been with education. One, there was Bill Gates, and we don't have the Bill Gates of education yet. So we need the Bill Gates of education. Carlos, Slim, please. Be the Bill Gates of education. We need that. Second, uh, we need the companies engaged because with health, there was pharma. And pharma was under attack for not providing the medicines. And Global Fund was a great partnership. All of a sudden, the pharma had a partner. And pharma did the right thing. It said, take it at cost take our licensing, whatever. MSF, by the way, played a heroic role in getting that done, as usual. It was a fight, but it got done. With education, we haven't had big companies involved, but the ones that should be involved now are the IT industry, basically, because that is a major input for effective education in the future. We need Huawei, Ericsson, uh, BT. We need uh, Facebook, I tried. Uh, so far, no success, but let's go back. We need Google. We need the big IT companies to say we're partners of the Global Fund for Education. We'll be there making sure there's connectivity, IT, access, and so forth. Now, let me turn to Romilly. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's, not, it's not me wanting to protect Romilly, but we, we do need to do this brief, because otherwise we're not going to okay. have opportunities. Could, could you hold it? Could you hold that? Absolutely. What, what I'll do, I'll um, I'll, send you I'll, I'll, uh, I'll invite you to lunch with me and Robert. Um, so I'm not going to invite academics to respond to that uh, observation, but I, I, um, I will invite the ambassador to look into opportunities for appointing Jeff uh, Omari, mayor of whichever part of Norway he wants to be. Uh, it will have to be Kirchenes in the far north. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Um, back, back to business. Uh, I'm going to go over this, this side now, please. And if I can ask people, the, the, the shorter people can keep questions, the more questions we can fit in. So, please. Alba de Souza from the Council for Education in the Commonwealth. Two very quick questions. One. One. Uh, well, uh, uh, <laughs> One question. water development hasn't been mentioned at all. I'm wondering whether it has been subsumed under infrastructural development, because I almost think that water development is more important than it than than energy, and the other one is maybe I'll speak with the ambassador after the session. It was to do with s small island exactly. states. Okay. Do, please, yeah. Hey, uh, Stacy Cram from Restless Development. Um, it's just to pick up on a point that um, the ambassador said on funding or in technology innovation and capacity <laughs> building, and whether you could just go into, I feel like those are the words that are banded around quite a lot without any um, meaning given to them. So what would a financing in these areas look like, and what should people advocating on these areas be focusing their attentions on? Thank you. And there was one right in the back here. Yeah. Thank you. Um, Georgina, I want to Gordon from Comic Relief. Um, thank you all from really, for really interesting, um, thought-provoking presentations. What I was wondering, and I was really in, um, excited, I think, a little, to see um, you mention um, civil society um, in your presentation, because that seems to be a missing piece. Now, I know we're talking about financing, but I wondered where, where there's this sort of nexus of all these events happening, how the voice of civil society really can be um, front and center of the debate, not just as them being recipients of, but active agents of change. 
Thank you. And the question right here. Is there a mic? Sorry, just in the second row. Thanks. Chris Isaac from AgDevCo. We hear from The Economist the world has to grow as much food in the next 40 years as it has in the past 10,000 years. We know that Sub-Saharan Africa today imports about $35 billion worth of food, which is about the same as bilateral odor. We saw from Romley's very striking chart that most of the poor in 2030 will be in Africa and they will be in rural areas, i.e. they are farmers. So the question is, what role for agriculture in the SDGs? And if I can sneak in a comment on the question of social protection, we look at weather index insurance as a solution, but it's expensive. You can't put premiums of 15, 20% onto small farmers. So okay. if there's a role for subsidy, it's, it's right there. Thank you. Um, and Where are you from, sir? Agdefco. And uh, right at the back. <coughs> uh, Chris Hoy, ODI. I just had a question about the role of developed country uh, donors. Uh, we've spoken a lot about uh, ODA. Uh, outside of Northern Europe and uh, the UK, uh, aid budgets have been slashed. Uh, aid agencies have been abolished. Uh, and this has led a lot of people to look to the developing world for uh, international public finance. But I was just hoping to hear some comments on the panel about uh, what role there is going to be for these uh, developed country donors into the future who maybe at the moment are heading in the wrong direction from what we'd like to see them. Okay, heading. right in front of you, but, uh, if you could keep it short. Very quick. I mean, on mix, uh, Romilly, um, he, we've talked about this a lot, especially while you're laughing, but um, you know, you're quite right to say that, th that mix should be able to raise these taxes and therefore should be less of a priority. The fact is that the majority of poor people live in mix, and the reality is they're not going to raise those taxes because of political um, realities in those countries. You know, you're not suddenly going to see in the next 10, 15 years all the people that should be paying suddenly paying. We should pressure them to. It's not going to happen immediately. In that context, are we just writing off their chances for decent education and health by focusing our international pressure on licks? given that the taxes are not going to be forthcoming in a realistic assessment. OK, thank you for that. Well, um, let me go back to the panel. I'll, I'll start on this side. Jeff, do you, do, you want, do you want to maybe start with that question? Sure. I, I think that's an issue that goes right to the heart of the, of the agenda for the, for the Addis Conference. Uh, the, the basic point, I would say, is if uh, middle-income countries can do it but aren't doing it, don't exaggerate what outsiders can do in that context because it's not so much. <clears throat> the reason that you can have a lot of uh, leverage in poor countries is that they want to do it but can't do it. But if you have a country that can do it but isn't doing it, it's not going to be determined from the outside. So it's just an exaggeration to say that we're going to decide Brazil's fate or Mexico's fate or Thailand's fate. Because they can afford this, they should do it, they should be part of the international commitments. And if there are poor people there that are suffering because of whatever the historical, political, socioeconomic legacies, the outside world's ability to navigate that is quite low. The reason it works in poor countries is that they want to stay alive and they want some help and we can make a difference <laughs> with the added resources. So if you're really looking at efficacy, uh, the reason why a middle-income country isn't doing it is relevant for your analysis. And I think that all of the uh, reasons, therefore, point to this kind of analysis. What are your needs? And get on with it. And if you don't get on with it, the rest of the world can't save you. There has to be a measure of subsidiarity in this. And I'm concerned about it two ways. There has to be a kind of realism in this whole process, which is the realism that the rich world's rich enough to make the material difference so that people are not suffering the way that they're suffering. That's one bit of realism. And the other bit of realism is we don't run other people's lives, and we shouldn't be attacking them to uh, change their governments, we shouldn't be making coups, we shouldn't be doing all of this. That's the second bit of realism. Third bit of realism is that crisis countries, we can never keep up with these wars. That's so if we really want to do development, it's not more humanitarian aid 
to war zones and conflict zones. It's to get these conflicts shut down. The war in South Sudan should never have happened. It is an incredible waste <laughs> and a tragedy. That one, I think, is mostly internal, actually. not Now, I believe that a lot of the wars we have in the world are U.S. caused, uh, not uh, just naive. And then pumping huge amounts into these conflict zones is not development. It's pathetic. Let's stop the wars. So that's a third bit of realism. And a fourth bit of realism is that we can't solve problems when people can't solve it themselves. And the subsidiarity doctrine is a real good doctrine, which is you solve the problems at the lowest levels possible. And if a country can solve its problems but isn't, the rest of the world can give advice, can make tables, can point out faults. But we shouldn't topple even dictators, in my view. Uh, we should say to the, you know, it's, it's not our, you can't save somebody else that isn't in that position to save themselves. And for the middle income countries, they can do this stuff. And they should. Brazil showed it. So let's put the attention where the need is. And if by chance you unlock not 0.7% of GDP, but 1.7% of GDP, then we'll reconsider the conversation. I'm all for more if you can get it, but given what we have right now, let's focus on the places that are ready to do it and absolutely need it. Jeff, can, can I just push you on one aspect of that? Because, you know, the, a couple of years ago, there was a quite heated debate here about India yeah. in this context. Now, you know, I, I know on the sort of indicators that Romilly was using that, you know, even if you had much higher marginal tax rates in India, you, there'd be a financing gap. But... You know, the strategic decision that was taken yep. in DFID was that you know, essentially you know, that India is no longer an aid story, right. it's a national development story. And, and I guess you, you know, there's a lot of grey area countries with, as the, the questioner asked, you know, an awful lot of poor <coughs> people in them that, you, you know, that run the risk of falling through the net here. And I, I, so I just taking India as an example, yep. I mean, just, just you know, what would your response be yeah, on that? So India is not an example. It is a civilization. Uh, and it's unique in the sense that it is, it's not unique. It's got one partner in this. It's got uh, almost 1.3 billion people right now. And therefore, it is distinctive in that it always received very low aid per capita throughout its history because aid per capita is inverse to capita in this world. It is not given on the basis of these need charts. Aid per capita is also given in country units because country units vote in the UN, because country units host military bases, because country units do things per country. And so if you do any aid allocation statistic, you'll find that tiny countries get hundreds of dollars or thousands of dollars of aid per capita because someone wants Tonga or Vanuatu or some other place to be their friend for some reason. Whereas if India were its states rather than 1.3 billion people, there would have been never a debate about this issue. For the last 30 years, India would have gotten vastly more aid per capita. Now, having said that, the question then is exactly as you posed it. Do Romilly's calculations, what are the needs? Has India graduated in that sense or not graduated? Let's make the calculation and do it on that basis. Thank you. Would you like to respond? I mean, there, there, are, there are a range of questions, I think, potentially very relevant for a fragile <coughs> state context. Um, let me start with the issue of uh, donor input. I think the donors are already doing quite a lot. They are talking to each other. They are coordinating to a certain extent. But I think they need to harmonize. They need to harmonize uh, among themselves and with this group of fragile countries. That's absolutely essential. I speak from experience. It takes a lot of uh, effort to create that kind of harmony. 
absolutely essential and contributes to aid effectiveness. And it reduces the time on the host country to do business. Infrastructure, the spin-offs, the externalities of creating a road, I think, are quite enormous. And you just create a road, a lot goes with it. We're talking about uh, delivery of health services, educational, clean water, uh, state building, and peace building. All this could easily find their place and facilitation by just creating a road between point A and point B. Civil society has a lot to do in the coming dispensation, SDGs and so on. You need to sensitize the communities. You need to inform them. I can tell you the, the, what happened during the MDGs and the new era that is coming may not be all that obvious to the communities back home and elsewhere. And I think uh, the role of the civil society needs to be clearly stated or emphasized somewhere in the design of the SDGs. There's quite a lot to, to, to do about that. Agriculture, I, I cannot think of a single uh, impact to food security uh, outside the area of agriculture. Production, whether for commercial purposes or for or subsistence farming and so on. I think the single most effective guarantee to food security is actually agricultural uh, production. So these issues are quite, quite important. And of course, I still want to, 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 to emphasize the role of uh, taxation in these countries in order to not only create capacity, but really to realize the, the, the financing uh, inputs to, 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 to the implementation or the execution of these SDGs. Uh, I could go on and on, but I think this is uh, what I want to... Thank you. It's a point very well, well made. Actually, one of the disadvantages of modern technology is you get constant reminders on your iPad of how far off track you've come in terms of keeping to the time. <laughs> so uh, thank you to my colleagues for uh, <laughs> providing me that reminder. Um, what, what I'm going to ask the last two speakers to do is, is maybe to take up one or two of the, qu of, of the questions and also of provide a, uh, some closing remarks. So, Romilly. Okay. Um, uh, Three, if it's closing remarks, four points. Quickly, um, on the mixed point, I absolutely agree with you. And also, Johnny, if you look at the poverty trajectories, um, it's not going to be a mixed problem for very much longer. I know there's discussions about that, um, but poverty is concentrated in mixed now. But actually, most of those countries will grow people out of poverty pretty quickly. So I completely agree with, with you also on the role of how much ex external actors can actually do in those countries. Um, the point that Chris Hoy made about other donors, and particularly non-DAC donors, for me, that's a question that I would like to know the answer to, because it seems to me fairly obvious that, um, A, we need more contributions from lots of these countries, and B, we need more transparency uh, around it, and we need common metrics and some way of uh, reporting, although people don't like the word reporting, or publication of information um, on that. But I don't know how politically you get that. So I don't know whether the ambassador has any ideas, but it seems every time I talk to anyone about this, people say, oh, it's incredibly difficult. They'll never agree to anything. So if there's any sort of option for getting any sort of targets or even aggregate numbers of the amount of IPF these countries are providing, I think that would be really, really valuable. Um, Civil society, yes, I agree, absolutely critical to this agenda, both in terms of the mobilization, as other colleagues have said, also in terms of delivery, a lot of these services, some of the good examples around social protection, again, have had civil society very much front and center involved in, in those, so absolutely critical. Um, and um, I can't remember what my final point, point was, which is... Uh, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. You have a final point? No, I mean, I just, I guess, I mean, we can perhaps agree to disagree on the on the, uh, the social protection fund, but I think um, my sense is that it is something that could be announceable, it's a deliverable, it would make a big difference, it would, uh, you know, pooled financing would actually have a big impact. So I think if we want something easily announceable, winnable, effective in uh, in Addis or thereafter, I, you know, from my sense, this is this is a big hit. But let's maybe carry on the conversation. Sure, it's on this <laughs> one, <Jeff. laughs> I, I think this is a longer discussion, but it, you know, there's clearly ideas to be de debated there, Ambassador. Mm. 
Well, I think this has been an extremely interesting uh, discussion, and in particular the latest discussion between Romilly and, and Jeff on, on this. I, I think that's uh, something we really should follow up on. And, uh, uh, you know, because I think it, it, we, at least we have identified an area where we need to do, uh, we need to do something. I think that's a key. Let me, uh, just by way of concluding, say that, you know, this has been understandably a discussion about public finance. But uh, as you will have understood from my introduction, uh, very much of this is also about sort of how do we unlock also the private sector finance, uh, both business community and investors. And I, you know, and here is should also we need to have a discussion on how ODA can unlock these sources. It, it's 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 difficult, uh, but we need to do it. And let me just mention energy as an example. We know that uh, approximately 1.3 billion people is without uh, access to energy, and it's basically it's India, it's uh, Nigeria, it's Ethiopia, and uh, DRC, and a few other places, uh, Bangladesh. Uh, we, we know that if we are to be successful in this, we need a cooperation between uh, public finance, uh, ODA, and we need uh, the international business community, the investor community. Today we are investing approximately 9 billion US dollars to get access to energy. We know we need annually, the next few years, if we are to be successful, approximately 45 billion. That's really, you know, if we're talking about trillions of dollars out there, that's really not much. But if you are focusing only on public finance, we will not be able to do it. So here we really need to see a cooperation between all the different sectors. So we need decisions from national governments. We need decisions from the business community, from investors. And we need from the, what I call <laughs> loosely sort of the international community. And here, of course, in particular, the multilateral development banks. And they need to get much more involved in these kinds of discussions if we are to be successful. And last but not the least, we, of course, we need civil society. As has been pointed out, we need civil society to put pressure in each and every country to move forward. And we need so civil society also to put pressure on us when we're moving forward, first to Addis, then to September in New York, and then in Paris in December. But thank you so much. Ambassador, thank you. Um, j just um, a couple of thoughts to close. Oh, Kevin, uh, can I have your word? Of course. <laughs> oh, I don't know. I thought I, you were just coming down the table. Jeff, I, I, I know if I say no, it'll make absolutely no difference. <laughs> <laughs> That's good. I'd rather, All right. I'd Very good. Uh, I, just, I did want to take a moment to disagree on uh, agreeing to disagree, uh, because I would rather have an agreement rather than a disagreement. Um, but I want to come back to the agriculture, because that's the missing fund, and that's where the social protection is going to come in. Uh, we need to help smallholder farmers uh, to be more productive. And uh, if you give cash and some of it shows up in agriculture, I'm not surprised. But if you actually help agriculture, more of it will show up in agriculture. You'll get productivity. You'll get nutrition, you'll get incomes, you'll get food security, you'll get poverty reduction. Uh, and so this is where that social protection should come in through helping smallholder farmers. Uh, this is a very high priority. Africa absolutely could be food sufficient. Not even a close doubt about that because it could so easily replace the imports of staple grains right now by a very modest increase of productivity of yield, that is. And that simply requires better inputs on the farm. It is not even in question. There are thousands of studies that show uh, at uh, a farm post uh, what could be accomplished. Instead of getting 1.2 uh, tons per hectare, you can easily get three, five, and now with solar-powered irrigation, this I just want to mention, <laughs> just solar-powered irrigation, which needs no energy storage, it's providing energy for pumping on, in real time with the sunshine, is so much cheaper than diesel, so much more sustainable than diesel, and water management is one of the core needs of African agricultural productivity. We have yet another breakthrough, another tool in our toolkit 
So this is the social, the true social protection fund is an agricultural smallholder uh, protection. This will boost incomes, productivity, food security, nutrition, health, the whole works. And that one we're going to agree to agree on, I hope. I see uh, <laughs> we're in danger of agreement breaking out across the, <laughs> across the panel. Je Jeff, just to add one point to that, and I think this relates to Mr. Sabuni's earlier contribution, is that, you know, that there are these huge untapped gains in productivity, as you mentioned. But the other critical thing, you know, the fact that you can export rice from Thailand or Vietnam to West Africa and out-compete a rice farmer in Senegal exactly. is extraordinary. And, and it relates to something that one of our teams here <laughs> work a lot on, uh, led by Dirk Willem, which is the internal barriers to trade, which are an important um, consideration. The lack of infrastructure, which drives up costs uh, as well. So you know, I think it, it comes back to your infrastructure point, actually. Could, um, since the various panelists have unilaterally taken the opportunity to make <laughs> Second closing remarks. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much. Um, I believe there are over 40 countries that are clearly fragile, and the number seems to be growing, unfortunately. But about 22 of these countries have clearly come out to admit their state of fragility, and they are members of the G7. Plus. They do not want to be in that club. That is not a club to be there permanently. They want to exit. They want to come out. They clearly require uh, understanding through their dialogue with the international community. They have come to this uh, uh, New Deal arrangement. The, 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 the roadmap is known. What needs to be done is known. And I think the SDGs should take this on board. They do not want to remain in that club, and they, 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 they deserve the attention of the international community. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. I'll have another quick go at closing remarks now. <laughs> um, I wanted to make two brief points. I was, I was very struck, Ambassador, by the point that you made about energy, because if you look, it, it's not just that we're starting from a bad place of 1.3 billion with no electricity. But if you look at the scenarios that have been developed by the International Energy Agency, mm. McKinsey's mm. and others, even the most ambitious ones, they still, in the case of Africa, mm. they still have 30% with no electricity mm. in 2040, mm. never mind 2030. Mm. So, you know, we're on the wrong trajectory here. And it's a classic global fund type challenge, actually, you know, that we have these low cost mm. solar technologies, we have this huge unmet demand that you know mm. people can't afford the three hundred dollars mm. to connect to the grid mm. in in mm. kenya mm. they can't afford the tar you know these very high cost tariffs but if there were financing mechanisms yeah. in place to sort of link the demand to the technology <coughs> it could really that could, i mean that is trans transformation yeah, that we're absolutely. talking about so you know i think reflecting on what could come out of addis to address that it, you know it seems to me a really important part of the story um the the, the, the other point I, I wanted to make is that, you know, I sometimes feel sitting here in London and listening to the debates around Addis and the SDGs that we, we sometimes forget what's at stake. Mm. And, I, and I think, as you know, you've made very clear, there's an awful lot at stake here for poor people in your country and in other parts of the world. And we really need to make sure that you know, we capture what Jeff did so brilliantly right at the mm. beginning to say you, this is a moment for humanity, yeah. that, you know, it's a, it's a fork in the road, yeah. if you like. If we carry on mm. as we are, we're going to lose an opportunity to, to fundamentally improve the human condition, to put it in, in those terms. I think, secondly, it's evident that all of these things are linked, that you know, you're leading a really important mm. process. But if we get that wrong, yeah. you know, it's going to make us look silly when we adopt ambitious SDGs without the sort of the financing framework. You know, it's going to derail anything ambitious coming out of um, out of Paris, which would be a, a disaster on, on a on a on a planetary scale. So, you know, I, I think working across the summits is is obviously critical, and I, and I think also in a lot of the questions and the speakers have made this point that w there's a lot of different pillars we need to put in place to change the trajectory we're on. That you know, research and evidence have a really clear role to play. And I, and I think the debate between Jeff and Romney was great on this, to sort of seriously debate evidence-based um, ideas. Secondly, that ideas 
without political impetus behind them are, are not going to work. You know, we need the social movement, but we need the smart political strategy. You know, we need to do on the progressive side what the Koch brothers do so brilliantly on the other side of the equation and sort of and, and, and make that work. And I think lastly, you know, we need to work together on this and get out of our silos. You know, you know it, it's great to have you here, and I'm, I'm hoping over the, the months ahead that ODI can work closely with you and that with all of you, you know, from the NGO community, from the business community, from the research community, you know, and, and from governments that are trying to make a difference that would have an opportunity to work together. So I want to say a huge thank you to all of our panelists, which I'm sure you'll join us. <laughs>